From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. Many of us had a wait, what, moment earlier this month as the Ontario Court of Appeal ruled that self-induced intoxication can now serve as a defense for the accused in sexual assault and other violent crimes. Sexual assault victims and human rights advocates are sharing their concern about potential attackers abusing this law. The question is, what message does this send to women who are subjected to sexual violence? Does this give the wrong message that men can engage in risky behavior and do incredibly harmful things and just claim to be too drunk and their conduct was involuntary? It's an important question when you look at these numbers from Stats Canada. 63% of murdered women and girls are killed by someone under the influence of an intoxicating substance. The Crown has planned to appeal this decision, and it will be up to the Supreme Court to eventually decide the fate of this. But is this going to be a further obstacle to justice for victims of sexual assault and violence? And could this scare them away from even being able to speak out? A lot of legal experts are saying there is little cause for concern, and the accused simply claiming to be drunk just isn't going to cut it. In today's episode, let's find out what exactly is going on, what is the intoxication defense, how did this even happen, and is it really as simple as we think? Karima Saad joins me now to help explain some of this. She's a prominent criminal and landlord tenant lawyer, and a lot of her work involves advocacy on human rights and social justice issues. Thank you, Karima, for speaking to me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So first of all, what exactly is the intoxication defense? I'm finding it a little difficult to wrap my head around it. Can you play out a scenario or case where this kind of defense could be used and how? It's an extremely rare defense. I think that that's something that needs to be clearly understood at the outset. So the intoxication defense does not apply If you go out on a bender and black out and wake up the next morning, this is more a scenario where you are essentially sleepwalking. You are a zombie. You are an automaton. So you are not acting voluntarily, meaning your physical movements, you know, there's a disconnect between what's happening in your mind and what your body is doing. You also are not reaching the necessary mental element that's required to voluntarily commit an offense. So this is not a run-of-the-mill situation where, again, after a kegger or something, a person claims that they lost control and didn't know what they were doing. This is very, very specific And it's where there's no moral blameworthiness because the crimes are committed unknowingly and unintentionally. So that should be something which would be hard to prove in court, wouldn't it? When I heard about the intoxication defense, it seemed like maybe someone could possibly get away with violent crime, assault or even murder because they were hammered, essentially. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of a misconception that comes out of this because that's not what the case is saying. And I want to agree with you that this would be very hard to prove in court. You would need to lead expert evidence, meaning a scientist or a doctor who comes to court and explains that you were not acting voluntarily, that any behaviors, you were in an automaton state. And of course, the the crown will also have their own expert who may have a different opinion. So the mere existence of the defense does not mean that someone will be able to successfully make that defense. What the Court of Appeal has done here is simply give defendants an opportunity to raise this because Section 33.1, up until this point, has prevented defendants from even trying. I understand that there is a distinction here between what is being perceived and what is technically the law. And I also know that there's no law in Canada against getting drunk, but it's certainly considered a criminal offense to, say, drive a car while impaired by either alcohol or drugs with penalties, depending on the harm. And the individual is responsible for that extreme intoxication to the point of voluntary 
automatism. But why doesn't that seem to apply when it comes to committing sexual assault? Why does that seem to be an exculpating factor here? It seems like a person's body that's violated and damaged is of lesser value than a crunched car or accident victims, maybe? I'd like to take a step back for a second and just outline what it takes to be found guilty of a criminal offense in Canada. Because I think that that understanding will sort of help answer your question. There are two things that need to be proven. First, that you did the act. And second, that you had the mental element necessary for the act to be blameworthy. Now, this mental element, it changes from one offense to the next. So there are certain crimes where simply by virtue of doing the act, that's enough. And you have a strict liability offense. And then you also have offenses where it's a less of a threshold. The difference, for example, between murder, which is premeditated, and manslaughter, where it's a different mental element, right? In the example that you've given, right? So someone who gets drunk and crashes a car, why would they not be protected in the same way as someone who's claiming the defense of extreme intoxication. It goes to the fact that extreme intoxication doesn't just mean you're super drunk. It means that you do not have any control over what you are doing. It's not just that you don't remember committing a crime. It's that you don't understand what was happening in reality at that time. So very, very different. And I think that it's even unlikely that alcohol could actually give rise to the extreme intoxication in the way that we understand it here. Alcohol was not a factor in either of the cases that the Court of Appeal was looking at. You had magic mushrooms and you had an overdose on pills. The focus on alcohol in practice will not actually be available as a defense because you're just unlikely to find scientific evidence that corroborates that your alcohol consumption led to a state of extreme intoxication. And again, the word intoxication, of course, it has sort of the common meaning or understanding, the dictionary definition, the way we would use the word. But in this context, it means that you are essentially an automaton. So think of it more as sleepwalking, where you don't know what your body is physically doing. You, again, are not understanding what is happening in reality at that time. And there's a disconnect between your mind and your body and the actions that you are doing. But don't you think it sort of formulates an excuse in a time where there's rising incidents of violence and assault against women and women's advocacy groups and legal organizations are already raising concerns about how this could potentially put women at greater risk. What do you think about the messaging of this on incidents of sexual assault and violence? Increasing awareness about violence against women and how that's dealt with in the courts. And we don't want to see situations where people are skating under the radar. But again, and not to sound repetitive, but what the Court of Appeal has done hasn't actually changed anything in that landscape. I think that it's a misplaced concern. There are very many things in our justice system that are counter to the ideals of feminism and good outcomes for women, I actually don't think that this case is one of them. We think about how sexual assault, for example, is dealt with in our justice system right now. The availability of this defense or not is really the, I don't want to say the least of our problems, but I do think that the actual rigors associated with sexual assault cases and the relatively low conviction rates and sort of what comes after that, this notion of carceral feminism, we are barking up the wrong tree by focusing on the unconstitutionality of section 33.1. So there's been a lot of debate about this over the years. How did this even happen? Is there any background to how the Ontario Court of Appeal issued this ruling that established this defense? It's always been the law that you're not guilty of a crime if it was committed while you were an automaton. But in 1995, Parliament introduced 
Section 33.1 to the Criminal Code, which carved out an exception to this rule. And the exception was basically if the intoxication was self-induced and if the crime committed was violent, then it doesn't matter that you were in an automaton state, you can still be found guilty. And that is what the Court of Appeal has taken issue with. They say, no, that's not true. And the reason that Parliament introduced this law in the first place in 1995, it was in response to a very high profile case at the Supreme Court level, which did involve a sexual assault. And the matter was ultimately retried. And so I think Parliament kind of picked up on the public opinion, moral outrage at that time. And that's where this section was introduced. And as you mentioned, we talked about how it's hard to prove an automaton state based on intoxication. But frankly speaking, women are the disproportionately targeted group here under these very circumstances. So the way this law is defined, is there worry that this could end up being another barrier to justice for women who are sexually assaulted might even discourage them maybe from coming forward? I think in the sense that if people misunderstand what this case is saying, and then believe that this is the state of the law, that actually, if you just get an aggressor is intoxicated, and they're not aware of their actions, they are somehow not morally culpable, and that's believed by the aggressor and or the victim, then yes, this could have a chilling effect. But that isn't because of the substance of what the decision says. As far as the actual substance goes, I don't actually believe that this changes the landscape in any meaningful way because it's so rare. What about in terms of messaging and perception, as you just alluded to? Yeah, messaging and perception, I see as much bigger issues. I'm not sure what the solution is there. The decisions from the Court of Appeal, I think, were fairly accessible in terms of the language, but still deal with very complex issues. So I don't know that the answer is to just tell everyone, go read Sullivan and Chan, and you know, you'll understand what's happening, because that's for sure overly optimistic. I think the media has an important role to play here and segments like this, obviously, where there's discussion about the implications and what this means and citizens and and lay people can hear this and hopefully understand. Now, of course, everything that I'm saying, there are counter arguments and rebuttals and various interveners on this case were concerned about how this could affect sexual assault cases. So I don't mean to suggest that there are no valid concerns, but I go back to my main point, which is the state of extreme intoxication that the court is referring to is extremely rare and probably cannot be achieved by consuming any amount of alcohol. So we're really talking about scenarios where there was an unintended state of automatism. And to equate someone making a decision to consume or ingest substances, and that's perhaps not an inherently illegal act, and then equate that to whatever act they commit while they are not in their right mind and they are not experiencing reality, there is a disconnect there. That's what we're dealing with here. So you talked about implications. Would there be any implications on currently ongoing cases of sexual assault and other cases of that nature? Could this potentially change things? I'm not aware of any cases. It's entirely possible, of course. I'm not aware of anything specific. And again, the Court of Appeal finding that this provision is unconstitutional only means that the defendants get a crack at making this argument. It doesn't mean that it's automatically going to be accepted. It will very much depend on how the evidence plays out. But because we are dealing with high stakes situations, that evidence will have to be tendered and it will be countered by the Crown. And ultimately, a judge or jury will 
have to consider the entirety. Self-intoxicated automatism is very, very rare. That's the bottom line and what I want to convey to everyone. So it's not going to capture someone going out to a bar or the club and having a good time and maybe overindulging. This is something different. And as you already mentioned, the Crown has plans to challenge this ruling. We know that. And there are plans to appeal to the Supreme Court. Can this ruling be overturned? The Supreme Court would have the power to overturn the Court of Appeals decision. So it's still possible that Section 33.1 will be found. It's unconstitutional regardless, but the question is whether or not it can be justified based on the purpose of the law, whether that is an important purpose, whether the law will actually fix the problem and if it's proportionate to the harm. So those are the questions that the Supreme Court will be considering. And it's really a weighing or balancing of competing rights and interests. It is possible. And I would expect that various groups who have taken an interest and already were interveners and wanted to say their piece on behalf of sexual assault survivors or other groups will have an opportunity to do so at the Supreme Court as well. And what do you see playing out next? Or do you have any thoughts on what should happen regarding this? Going back to the facts of the cases at hand and the tragedies that resulted and the fact that even though both Chan and Sullivan and I guess Mr. Chan took magic mushrooms, which may have interacted poorly with an underlying brain injury. He went into a state of psychosis. He thought he was God and hurt his father as a result. And in Sullivan's case, he was trying to commit suicide by overdosing on pills, didn't have the intended effect. Instead, he also went into this state of extreme intoxication and stabbed his mother. So, you know, these are very tragic cases. And because Section 33.1 prevents the defendants from even raising the circumstances as a, a legitimate defense, they're essentially condemned before they get a chance to say their piece because of how this exception to the rule operates. I do think, actually, that 33.1 should be removed from the criminal code. And I say that because I'm mindful that Extreme intoxication is very rare as a defense, very rare as a successful defense. So I see the status quo pre-Ontario Court of Appeal decision as being unfair to accused or defendants who can't access a defense that they should otherwise be entitled to, where there's no question that they were not in their right mind, they were in this zombie-like state. So just before we go, I just want you to clarify for us in terms of if somebody is using this so-called zombie-like state as a defense, how or what would they need to prove that in court? Because you said it's almost unachievable. You're going to rely on medical experts and scientific evidence. Presumably, there's a variety of ways that that could be handled or, or the evidence could be adduced. But almost certainly, you're going to look at the individual and any underlying conditions that they might have, anything that could cause them to react. And you'd also be looking at the substance itself. How have other people reacted with the substance? It's a very like scientific argument. And again, the Crown would probably be raising their own expert evidence as well. So it would be a long shot. It's a long shot because it's so rare, not a long shot because it's an impossible defense to raise, but just because it's so rare. Right. Thank you so much, Karima, for talking to me and clarifying this for us today. Thank you for having me. That was Karima Saad, a prominent criminal and landlord tenant lawyer, and her work also involves a lot of advocacy on human rights and social justice. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazas, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. 
We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 